I've got lunatics laughing at me from the woods. My original plan has been scuppered now that the jeeps haven't arrived. My communications have completely broken down. Do you really believe that any of that can be helped <laughs> by a cup of tea? Couldn't hurt, sir. Hey there, this is Joe Buccino. That was a scene from the 1977 film A Bridge Too Far, and this is the 18th Airborne Corps podcast. Broadcasting from the center of the military universe, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, this is the 18th Airborne Corps podcast, the official podcast of America's Contingency Corps. Welcome back to the program. As stated, I am Joe Buccino, and this is the 18th Airborne Corps podcast. This is a podcast in which we talk about and analyze news of the day, news across the Army. We also talk about leadership, and we talk about Army history. That's what we're doing today. We're releasing this episode in concert with the 77th anniversary of Operation Market Garden. Operation Market Garden, of course, was a massive Allied operation during World War II. This episode is part of our ongoing series of podcasts on Market Garden. So if you're listening to this, you know you have a baseline of knowledge on Market Garden. But just to quickly set the table, Market Garden, of course, consisted of two operations, Market, an airborne assault to seize key bridges. It was the largest airborne assault up to that point in the war. And Garden, a ground attack over Highway 69, later come to be known as Hell's Highway, that moved over the seized bridges and created the salient. Okay. So we've talked about Operation Market Garden before, really no need to recap it in detail here again. As everyone listening knows, Market Garden was a disaster. It was, by all accounts, a failed operation. So many reasons for failure for Market Garden, a lot that could have gone wrong with such a spectacular, daring operation, and so much of it did go wrong. This episode is not going to adjudicate that or assess blame. Instead, we're going to talk about the movie, A Bridge Too Far. It really is a well-known cultural touchstone, a point of reference for World War II for many Americans, at least my generation. We brought on the perfect guest to discuss this film. Dr. Russell Burgos has a PhD in political science from UCLA. He works here on Fort Bragg at the National Defense University, where he's an associate professor in the Joint Special Operations Master of Arts. He joined NDU after more than 12 years as a professor at UCLA, at Claremont McKenna College, and at Pepperdine University. So this guy has extensive experience teaching courses in American and international politics, in globalization, great power competition, political theory. So he's well-rounded in many subjects related to national security. But for our purposes, he spends a lot of time thinking, talking, and writing about the role of American film in the way the country understands war and its army. That's what we're here talking about. We get into a bridge too far and cover that in some detail, but we also get into the broader question of the war film, the American war film, and why it's important. And we also talk a little bit about Vietnam and that genre of film, really starting with the Oliver Stone film Platoon. So this is a discussion on a bridge too far and on the role of the war film on the American psyche. So, a lot of wisdom, a lot of nuggets in here, and uh, I hope you find it insightful. Here's my discussion with Russell Burgos. My first question to you, Russell, and I'll give you my answer, but I want you to answer first. Is A Bridge Too Far a good movie? Is it a good movie? In terms of, like, is it an entertaining movie? No. <laughs> <laughs> Could I read you something in it, by way of answering that? Absolutely. This, you remember Roger Ebert? Of course I do. I'm from yeah. Chicago. Okay. Okay. All right. I bet a lot of people, like, listening to this won't know who that is. Maybe, I hope, I hope they will. He died in two, 2013. He did. He had a, had quite, quite tragically, actually. He lost his lower jaw to cancer. But there's there's a very good documentary about him, actually. I didn't know that. Yeah, he continued writing um, reviews, even though he couldn't speak anymore. And one thing that he did as he was dying was he went back over old reviews uh-huh. and sort of reevaluated some movies that he had thought weren't so good uh-huh. 
Uh, I suspect this was not one of them. <laughs> well, rest in peace, Roger Ebert. I didn't know that sad story. But this is what he wrote in 1977. And it speaks for... And I, I, I saw the movie four times before I found this. This is his quote. Uh, because A Bridge Too Far is such an exercise in wretched excess, such a mindless series of routine scenes, such a boringly violent indulgence in all the blood and guts and moans they could find, that by the end, we're prepared to speculate that maybe Levine, I think Levine made the movie, went two or even three bridges too far. That's it, It's hard to watch all the way through. First it of all, is. It's three hours. It's tedious in many parts. And it doesn't really, I don't like, I don't watch a lot of movies. You do. But it doesn't like drive the action forward very well. It doesn't. So uh, I, I have a, a quote as well. So the, <laughs> the part about Roger Ebert that you left out, um, he described it as the longest B-grade war movie ever made. <laughs> um, and Vincent Canby in the New York Times described it as massive, shapeless, often unexpectedly moving. Confusing, sad, vivid, and very, very, very long. Yeah. yeah, right. And it is. So I watched it last night, actually. Okay. And Well, I appreciate that. There are 39 minutes of screen time before the first C-47 takes off. Mm. Now, in 1977, movies had a mean runtime of 110 minutes, mm -hmm. which means that before you get any kind of action at all, you've already sat in the theater for about 35% of the time that you would have for any other movie. Oh, wow. Um, so, I mean, that's it's, that's what makes it an authentic movie, in a sense, but not an especially good movie to watch because so much of it is spent in setting up Market Garden as complex an operation as that was, yeah. as sort of ill-conceived an operation as it was, mm -hmm. Attenborough is compelled to give us so much backstory. Mm -hmm. Attenborough was the what? Pretty? Richard Attenborough was the director. Joseph E. Okay. Levine was the producer. Gotcha. Okay. And the screenplay was written by, by the great uh, William Goldman, who mm -hmm. also wrote Marathon Man, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, okay. um, all kinds of movies. Okay. And so... The reason I think in one part it's so long and so tedious is that it was a passion project for Levine, mm. who knew Cornelius Ryan and promised Ryan on Ryan's deathbed oh, that wow. he would turn it into a movie. So I did not know that. And Cornelius Ryan, of course, wrote the great book. I thought it was a great book. Yeah. A Bridge Too Far. Um, also wrote The Longest Day, right. man, uh, the novel upon which that movie is, is based. So, well, I didn't know that little backstory there um i think it's a it's in a monster cast and, and i think may, many of these names i think hopefully a lot of them are still well known some of them are still working in movies to some extent i know sean connery we lost sean connery last year 007 007 and for our purposes here roy urquhart right or urquhart and you know there's a just a big cast of characters because i i guess there's a lot of people that had critical roles in this. So why don't you maybe just tell us a little bit about the cast here. Sure. So the, the first thing about the big cast is that's actually how Levine got the, the money to make the movie. Mm -hmm. So Levine came to motion pictures late. He was born in 1905, Jewish immigrant family. Mm -hmm. And he was a real sort of old school macher, right? I mean, he was a hustler. Mm -hmm. And he initially got into the rag trade and moved into movies by buying uh, a cinema. And then looking for distribution rights for things. So at, by the 70s, the studio system was gone and movie stars could command huge salaries. Well, Levine couldn't pay them huge salaries. So what he agreed to do was every A-list star got screen time and they all got basically a quarter of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so you have Dirk Bogard playing Lieutenant General Frederick Boy Browning. Mm -hmm. He's the overall British commander. Mm -hmm. uh, Bogard was a... a a screen idol, especially in the British cinema for decades. Mm -hmm. Sean Connery, as you said, plays Major General Roy Orcart. Edward Fox plays Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks, commander of British 30 Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, the great American method actor Gene Ackman plays Major General Stanislaw Sosabowski, the commander of the 1st Independent Parachute Brigade for Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan O'Neill, another screen idol, plays Major General James Gavin, of course, of our own 82nd. 
Paul Maxwell, who was a Canadian actor who specialized in playing Americans, mm -hmm. played Major General Max Taylor of the 101st. Anthony Hopkins, who everybody knows from Silence of the Lambs type roles, um, played Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Frost, who was the commander of uh, the British First Airborne at Arnhem. And Robert Redford plays Major Julian Cook of the 504th PIR here at the, the Vol River Crossing. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you had a, a, a slew of other actors. Elliot Gould played Lieutenant Colonel Stout, who was a fictionalized version of Robert Sink mm -hmm. of the 506th PIR, who I think most people listening will know as having been played by Dale Dye in Band of Brothers. That's right. Um, and a big figure in the 101st Airborne for a while. Oh, Sink, that. yeah, for sure. Um, Maximilian Schell, who was a highly esteemed Austrian actor, um, his breakthrough Oscar winning role was as the defense attorney in Judgment at Nuremberg. Um, he played SS General Bittrich, the overall German commander on the scene. Um, Wolfgang Price, who would be very familiar to anybody who watched American war movies of the 60s and 70s, um, plays Gert von Rundstedt. Um, like Shell, he was typecast after the war. Um, he played five German field marshals in a 20-year period, including mm -hmm. one fictional one in the TV series, The Rat Patrol. Mm -hmm. Hardy Kruger, who would also be very familiar to people who watched war movies of that generation, um, plays SS Major General Ludwig, who was based on a real general named Heinz Hamel, who lived in obscurity after the war. He was the commander of 10th SS Panzer. Uh, even Richard Attenborough has a cameo in this. He's one of the lunatics that is on oh, wow. Sean Connery's landing zone. Yeah, um, I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, the, the last lunatic that you see who salutes the British troops, that's mm -hmm. actually Attenborough. Mm -hmm. um, and John Ratzenberger, who was Cliff Clavin on Cheers and is a character in every Pixar movie. Uh, he played a character called Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. um, and then he also played Lieutenant uh, in Attenborough's other big blockbuster, Gandhi. So nearly everybody was in this in one way or another, including 50 background actors from Britain um, who were known as Attenborough's private army. Mm. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. I, I want to ask you about two other uh, figures in the film. One is, well, portrayed in the film is Brian Urquhart who was the British intel officer, apparently yes. a brilliant uh, man, who, who pieced together that there were German tanks in the in the town and warned against uh, the airborne insertion and was basically dismissed and, and I think in some ways ridiculed. He's given a different name, Fuller, probably because... So the, the audience isn't confused. confused. Right. right, right, right. Urquhart and, and Urquhart. And then the other one that I thought was interesting, you know, James Kahn plays this soldier who, Eddie Duhon, who pulls a pistol on a medic, on, on a doctor, to try to save his fellow soldier. Right. And I don't know if that really happened or not. Uh, there's, there's a sort of a mixed stories that maybe he was a composite character, okay. maybe there was an instance like that. Um, but Major Urquhart was a real person. That's right. Um, uh, he was called uh, called Major Fuller in the in movie. The movie. Yeah. Um, no relation to the general officer, mm -hmm. um, and and it's because of of Fuller slash Urquhart's role that for many years in the historiography, Market Garden has been described among other things as an intelligence failure. Mm -hmm. um, but more recent historiography, including the the decrypts of Ultra which Ryan, Cornelius Ryan, would not have had access to when he was writing, but which were declassified within months of the book coming out. It's probably an overstatement to say that it was an intelligence failure. Um, the Allies mm. knew from Ultra the rough dispositions of 9th and 10th SS Panzer. Okay. Um, they did have fairly good intelligence from the Dutch underground. Mm. <clears throat> and they did have good photographic intelligence. So Urquhart... Um, was in fact really put on sick leave because of exhaustion, mm -hmm. so to speak. He's moved out of the way. He's gotten out of the way because nobody wanted to hear anything that would suggest that this couldn't go through. Mm -hmm. Because of those 15 or 16 canceled airborne operations that preceded it. Yeah. Um, and and there, there is a an illusion, I think, in the movie that the British officers are afraid of Montgomery. 
So that's interesting, right? That's that's been a and long. And Montgomery. Well, no, I'm sorry, not to interrupt you, but I I also think it's interesting that Montgomery's not in the movie, and he's such a he casts such a large shadow over Martha Darden. Montgomery is the missing character. Yeah. But that's actually historically accurate because this was one of the very few operations and and any operation of this scale that Montgomery didn't personally command. Oh yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. So he planned it, but he was not in overall command. Um, although the, the mission itself was commanded by Boy Browning, first Allied Air Army was actually commanded by what today would be a U.S. Air Force officer, mm. a General Barrington. That's right. That's right. So yeah. Montgomery's ghost or his shadow, I suppose, sort of looms over the entire operation. And for decades, Americans were critical of him because like Can and and his operations in, in the Low Countries, he sort of overestimated what was possible, especially given the limitations of terrain. I don't know that I would describe the British officers as being afraid of Montgomery so much as having been in awe of Montgomery. Mm. So there's a line in that long, early meeting of the generals thing um, where, in fact, Major Fuller Urquhart goes to Boy Browning uh, and Browning basically says, too many operations have been canceled. This game is not going to be canceled. It's on. Mm -hmm. And so one of the controversies among many was the fact that in one sense, this was not even necessary. Um, the, the, one of the rationales was the, the size of the allied logistics trains. Um, the fact that you had to go all the way back to Cherbourg in the Cotentin Peninsula to get mm -hmm. reliable logistics. But once Antwerp was captured, it wasn't necessary. Um, in a sense, Market Garden, at least from my perspective, was much more about Montgomery's perhaps understandable desire to have the, you know, the lightning stroke into the heart of Germany. So being able to cross the Rhine would have allowed him to get right to the Ruhr, which was the industrial heartland of Germany. And then it's a very short drive to Berlin from there. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Eisenhower and the Americans had been proponents of what was called the, the broad front strategy, where, mm -hmm. you know, we're sort of advancing across the entirety of, of France. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the awe in which... Montgomery was held, and and frankly, the respect with which Montgomery was treated by his fellow British Army officers, mm -hmm. um, that I think led to a sense that this is his plan, and we've got to go with it. But we know from the historical record that Eisenhower's chief of staff, for example, uh, General Walter Biddell Smith, thought that it was a bad idea. Ridgway, in his memoirs, said that he thought it was a bad idea. Um, Gavin didn't render a verdict about the plan, but he did render a verdict about British generalship, which was underwhelming to him. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of that was centered on Boy Browning himself. Mm. On that point of, of Boy Browning, at the end of the film, Boy Browning... So, so bottom line, in the beginning of the film, he's optimistic about Mark Gunn, as I think as you just alluded to. This is going to happen. We're doing this. And then at the end of the film, he reverses his position... And he says, this is played by Dirk, Dirk Bogart, he says, I always felt it was a bridge too far. I've just been on to Monte. Very proud, pleased. Pleased, of course. Evix Market Garden was 90% successful. But what do you think? Well, as you know, I've always thought that we tried to go a bridge too far. He's portrayed as a cowardly figure in the film. I understand that never happened. Nobody can confirm that it happened because the meeting that he took with Montgomery, uh, he and Montgomery were the only two in there. Okay. So that was a little bit of historical license from mm -hmm. Cornelius Ryan, who then made it the title of the book. And of course, now it's just an idiom that people right. use to describe anything. Anything um, that's like military overreach. Well, uh, or I guess I've even seen it used just in overreach in general. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, to the extent that that was said or not said, it is it is reported that it was said actually before the operation That's that right. that okay. Arnhem was the bridge too far. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some not for the statement itself, but there's some justification for that, because um, Arnhem was assigned to British First Airborne 
which was the least experienced of all the airborne elements in the operation mm -hmm. and had never operated in division strength. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I don't want to be like, rah, rah, go 82nd or anything, yeah. but if that was the critical target, rather than give the 82nd Airborne the southernmost targets, give them the northernmost target, because mm -hmm. the division had actually fought as a division. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I think in that scene, that in that closing scene, or it's the next to clip penultimate scene, um, Urquhart, played by Sean Connery, is at this point, you know, very disaffected with the leadership and was concerned from the beginning about the size, the scope, the magnitude. And he's talking to uh, Boy Browning and Browning then says, well, I always thought it was British before. So, you know, it, it certainly paints him in a very negative light. In, in this film. So, you know, I think from the American perspective of our understanding of Market Garden, I may be overselling the, the impact of this movie, but I think for my generation of army officers, our understanding is based on this movie, at least in part. And I wonder if that's true of the broader country or the broader military. And I also wonder how I, I wonder about the British perspective on the film Bridge to Power because because Brit as I we you and I were talking before we started recording there's or maybe there used to be I don't know if there still is so much you know emotion tied up in the assessment of blame around Market Garden there is um, what's interesting is even at the time British critics were critical of the movie for the way that it portrayed British officers. And American critics were critical of the movie for the way that it portrayed American officers. In what, in what regard? Uh, for example, nobody liked Ryan O'Neill's performance as General Gavin. Um, they said, I think Roger Ebert, in fact, described him as an adolescent just waiting to ask anybody if they wanted to play tennis. Even though I don't get that. I don't, I don't either. <laughs> and what's interesting is Ryan O'Neill was 37, which was the age Gavin was during the operation. Yeah. And in his memoirs, Gavin talks about this and he says that it wasn't the performance. It was that that Ryan O'Neill was too good looking. OK. To play him. OK. But Gavin was like a handsome. He was. But I mean, Ryan was a you know, he was a right. matinee right. idol. Right. You know, he was a heartthrob. Girls had posters of him That's on right. their walls. That's right. But but I did feel like he was sort of the character was, you know, very even keel. He was trying to focus his men on the mission. And then he had this great leadership role where he talked Julian Cook. In, I don't remember the exact commentary, but it's like, you know, I need somebody who's fast enough to do this. I need somebody who this is this is the crazy River crossing, Vol River right. crossing. I need somebody who's crazy enough to lead this. I need somebody who's brave enough to do this. Oh, and one more thing. I need somebody who's dumb enough to do this. I'm sending two companies across the river by boat. I need a man with very special qualities to lead. Go on, sir. He's got to be tough enough to do it. And he's got to be experienced enough to do it. Plus one more thing. He's got to be dumb enough to do it. And then he's like, so he's talking, he's building back Julian yeah. Cook. Now, there's a whole backstory to that that's not really in the movie. But, I don't know, that was, I thought, a very compelling scene for me. Oh, I, I quite like Ryan O'Neill's performance mm -hmm. in this. Um, I don't like Gene Hackman's performance. Okay. I don't like Elliot Gould's performance. Elliot Gould <laughs> is hamming it up. Um, <laughs> it was too, like, over the top, like, I'm the everyman. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Joe. And, of course, Robert Sink was anything but that. Robert Sink was this incredibly elegant guy right. who just had a real troop touch. Um, yeah. I think you're right that what Americans know about Market Garden, they know from the movie. Okay. Uh, but of course, that's characteristic of, of nearly all military operations and war movies. Mm. Um, that's right. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of that. And I, mean, I think this is like, now we're in, part, you know, you have your expertise is in many fields. This is something you know a lot about. Yeah, this is something that I'm particularly interested in is how does popular culture teach American society mm -hmm. what to expect of military capabilities? Mm. Um, and just in, in a general sense, I think that it teaches Americans to overestimate what the armed forces can do, which leads to an over-dependence on that particular instrument of power. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, you know, so? if, if there's a problem, throw special forces at it. Those guys can do anything. They can parachute out of airplanes from outer space and they yeah. have dirt bikes with surface to air missiles and okay um so because 
because Attenborough was concerned about making the movie authentic, mm -hmm. and I think it's always important for war movie viewers to differentiate between accuracy and authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of war movie viewers get hung up on accuracy. Um, you know, oh my God, that guy's patch is on upside down or something. Mm -hmm. But what filmmakers want is authenticity. Mm -hmm. It seemed so real that it must have been the true story. And authenticity so if, in terms of the the emotional component right. to it, the interactions, the human yeah. element. Okay. And the Americans do good in the movie and the British do bad. Therefore, it must have been a British failure. Mm -hmm. And I think British historians and, and British filmgoers have been sensitive about that, and, and rightfully so. Mm. Um, because again, First Allied Airborne Army was commanded by an American, and American was the supreme commander in Europe. Um, and both of them essentially said, yeah, we can do this. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the blame for the, for the operation in one sense, I think, is fairly attributed to Boy Browning. Um, but everybody has, has a share of it. To include Gavin? Even Gavin, because Gavin knew better. Um, and and he, he became more fond of, of Boy Browning over time. And he quite mm -hmm. admired Urquhart. Mm -hmm. um, but Gavin, even more so than Max Taylor, was far and away the most experienced airborne divisional commander the Allies had. Mm -hmm. For all, I mean, he was the American version of Kurt Student, the, mm -hmm. the German airborne commander. Mm -hmm. um, and for him not to speak up or not to try to revise the plan... Perhaps it was allied maintenance. Perhaps it was the fact that he was comparatively junior in age and rank to people like Boy Browning. Um, but that gets to one of those sort of core issues of military ethics. Do you just salute yes, sir, about face and, and carry out the mission? Or do you fight for what you think is right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't look at the map and see that there's only one highway between Belgium and Holland. Mm -hmm. And realistically believe that somebody is going to move a mechanized core up that highway. Right. Right. Yeah, I think that, you know, in that sense, I think there's value in the movie uh, in terms of describing you know, up front and all the time to spend up front describing everything that could have gone wrong and then everything that did go wrong. You know, really the position that these British, Polish, and American soldiers were placed in was, you know, by their leadership, they were placed in an incredibly, tight, basically an impossible position. <laughs> yeah. Anthony Beaver, who's a British historian, and he's done a lot of work on Arnhem in recent years, said that the key failure of the operation was that it assumed nothing would go wrong. Yeah. And in fact, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And even things that went right were sort of ironically wrong. So one of the things that I've often thought about, and, and it, it relates to the, to the Gavin character, um, after that meeting of the generals when Gavin is down on the airfield with his Dutch advisor, he talks about being worried that it's a daylight jump, that there's this, there's that. And of course, the fact that it was a daylight jump into the Low Countries meant that as an airborne operation, it was flawless. Everybody landed on the drop zone where they were supposed to be, when they were supposed to be there. The weird thing from my perspective is that actually hurt the success of the operation. Because unlike D-Day, when you've got the, the mythical little groups of paratroopers running around all over, mm -hmm. because everybody landed coherently, the Germans knew exactly where to mass their forces. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, and that's captured in the film. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that is a great scene. It's in my mind. It's an impressive scene in the film. Attenborough said he cried when he first saw the jump scene screened mm -hmm. because it was such a technical undertaking. Yeah. And there's one, I, 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 I saw this two days ago, so forgive me, but there's one German officer who goes out to the balcony and he's just in awe of this just sky full of, full of paratroopers. And I think his, his notion on this or his statement is, you know, I wish we had this kid. God, if we had this capability, you know, so anyway, it's a great scene for me. Um, up front, one of the other scenes that I really did like, but I, I don't think I fully understood it was the uh, Brian Horrocks, 30 Corps commander played by Edward Fox. 
he's giving the presentation in this theater. He's giving the overview, the briefing to his men, his his uh, officers, and he's describing this and in a, I guess, a tongue in cheek manner. He's making jokes about how tricky this is going to be and how complicated and how things can go wrong. And and I couldn't tell if he was trying to, you know, kind of downplay the seriousness of it in order to put his men at ease and get them ready for the mission, or if he's trying to relate to them, or if he's really just being dismissive of Eisenhower and Monty. Gentlemen, this is a story that you will tell your grandchildren, and mightily bored they'll be. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. What's your take on that scene? So Horrocks actually did give that briefing mm-hmm. almost that way. Mm. Um, Edward Fox knew Brian Horrocks and oh, had wow. immense okay. respect for him mm-hmm. and took very seriously the responsibility of playing him well and accurately. The, the, the part about we're the cavalry and the paratroops are the settlers and the Germans yeah. are the Indians – um, that was actually some license by William Goldman, the mm-hmm. screenwriter, who felt that it was important to put some language in there that would help film goers understand in a more intuitive way what the scope of the operation was. So by putting it in American cinematic terms, what Goldman was trying to do was was take this 650 page Cornelius Ryan book and this incredibly complex military plan and say, you guys get this. It's, it's, this is just a John Wayne movie and Edward Fox is John Wayne. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, but there, you know, Horrocks was, um, was a real troop officer. General Gavin described him, um, this way. Gavin wrote about Horrocks in his memoirs. Uh, quote, he was a truly unique general officer, and his qualities of leadership were greater than I have ever seen. In lecturing at the American Service School, meaning Leavenworth, I state frequently that General Horrocks was the finest general officer I met during the war and the finest corps commander I ever heard of. Mm. Um, so if Gavin, you know, was willing to go out and, and say that about Horrocks, right. um, I, I think we can we can trust Fox's performance there that it was it was comedic, but it was straight mm-hmm. because that was Horrocks. Mm-hmm. Um, after the war, Horrocks became what's called the gentleman usher of the Black Rod, which is the sort of sergeant at arms of the House of Lords, which is very estimable position. Mm-hmm. Um, he became uh, like a presenter on a very early sort of history channel in Britain, designed one of the very early war games to sort of teach people tactics. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, he, he actually died at the age of 89 in the 1980s. And, oh, wow. and ap- as a result of this, um, he and Fox were even closer for the, for the remainder of his life. Hmm. There is a story, I don't know if this is true, there's a story we were talking a little bit about uh, Robert Redford, who plays Julian Cook. And, you know, really, t- to me, I think the most human scene is when he's crossing the, the river and he's he's praying the Hail Mary over and over. He's terrified, you know, leading his men and gets him to the other side. Hail Mary. And I understand that really did happen. It did, but what the film gets wrong there is that he changed Hail Mary a little bit because it was a cadence that Mm -hmm. he had noticed that many of his troops who had no experience in river crossings, let alone an assault river crossing were paddling against each other. And so they were turning circles. And then of course they were sitting ducks for the Germans, even more than the 504th already was sitting ducks for the Germans. Mm -hmm. Um, And so Hail Mary, Full of grace. Gotcha. That was a stroke okay. call, as okay. if he was a coxswain on a on a crew in the Charles River in Boston. Okay. Um, and so it was so, really just a device. It wasn't. A well, prayer. it was a it was a prayer too, because Cook was an extraordinarily devout Catholic, mm-hmm. um, and so he gets Cook and the five hundred fourth get a lot of credit for that, of course. But what's interesting is in the book. What Ryan emphasizes is C Company of the 307th Airborne Engineer Battalion. Mm. He says, Cook and the infantry went across once. The engineers went across five times. That's right. 
They were the real heroes. That's right. So they were in charge of, I think people, I forgot about that, but they were in charge of, the engineers were in charge of the, the boat crossing. That's right. And they just had to get the 504th across. But Robert Redford was playing an infantry commander in the movie, so he got the screen time. That's right. <laughs> I did hear, so I don't know if this is true. <clears throat> I think it is. But he was paid $2 million for his role, Robert Redford, and he didn't have that much screen time, and it set off controversy with some of the other actors. So it seems, yeah. that seems like no money now, by the way. Well, you also have to adjust for inflation. Of right? course. So I, I, I actually calculated it, I believe, because that's what geeky professors do. The entire film cost $26 million. At the time, At the time. it did. Um, that's about $130 million today. Okay. Uh, the stars got a quarter million a week, which is about $1.1 million a week today. Okay. Um, and... Redford was the second choice for Cook. The first choice was Steve McQueen. I think I did hear this. And McQueen bargained and bartered with Levine for almost two weeks' time, almost to the point where one of the terms of, of McQueen's deal was Levine had to buy his house in Palm Springs. Um, mm. But ultimately, McQueen <laughs> Wait, bargained what? him. Yeah. And, and Levine would have done it. Had to buy... The Levine house. would have had to have bought oh, McQueen's Steve house. McQueen's house in Palm Springs, okay. which he was interested in selling at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and Le frankly, Levine would have done it. Uh, at one point early in his career, Levine borrowed a million dollars for a day mm -hmm. so that he could go to a group of distributors that he was screening some B-grade horror movie to. And he could say, look at all this money I've made from this movie already. If you screen this movie in your theater, you'll be just like me. And then he has somebody drive it right back, you know, to the to the loan shark that he borrowed it from. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, McQueen bargained himself out of the deal. Um, it was more a question, really, of all of the stars, of course, felt that they were the most important star. Sure. With the possible exception of Dirk Bogard, who was in many ways a remarkably modest man. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, the amount of money that Redford got was a bit of a grievance. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, they all got paid. They all made a movie. Um, and they all were somewhat disappointed that it wasn't an especially successful movie, mm. especially given the, the year of release. Mm. Yeah, well, let's uh, let's talk about a little bit of that because we talked a little bit on the phone about that the year release, nineteen seventy seven. That was it is that is a hard year to make a movie, um, or to make this movie, mm -hmm. and so it's number eight at the box office, and number wow. eight at the box office. That sounds pretty good, uh -huh. um, but uh, see here, I'll give you some some comparative data. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's a film out of its time. So you have Annie Hall, Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. These all came out at the same... In the same year. And it's the summer. And that's when you want to make all your money before Labor Day. So yeah. number eight at the box office sounds good. Mm -hmm. But Smokey and the Bandit, mm -hmm. which I think was number seven at the box office, did twice the returns. I don't think I know that movie. Smokey and the Bandit, Burt Reynolds, okay. the Trans Am. It's a okay. you know, good old boy yeah, yeah. drinking movie. Okay. Saturday Night Fever did three times the amount of wow. box office. Um, Star Wars did $460 million at the box office, which was nine times the amount that um, this movie returned. And so it made its production costs, which is the threshold definition of a success in Hollywood. Mm hmm um, the British premiere was attended by Lord Mountbatten. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a huge event in London. Mm -hmm. It got some awards in Britain. It was quite popular in Britain. Um, but by the standards of 1977, in terms both of, of production itself and in terms of money, it was a movie out of its time. It was an old-fashioned war movie at precisely the moment where the ground had shifted. Uh, Cross of Iron came out, which was um, Sam Peckinpah's only war movie. It's a typical squad movie about a German reconnaissance squad on the Eastern Front. Odd mm -hmm. choice for Peckinpah to make. Mm -hmm. um, the Eagle Has Landed came out that year, which is an, uh, another World War II movie. It's about a team of German commandos who are trying to kidnap Churchill. That's right, yeah. Um, and MacArthur had come out, that huge epic biopic Okay. And yeah. it was a total yeah. dud. Mm -hmm. So you had these sort of 
somewhat archaic 1960s style World War II movies. And then these very exciting new sci-fi movies, Star Wars and Close Encounters. Mm -hmm. um, and then these kind of small movies like Annie Hall and Coming Home um, that were much more intimate, but mm -hmm. also very well acted. Mm -hmm. And then in 1979, you get Apocalypse Now. And so the war movie genre at that point is completely different. Because now we're focused on Vietnam. Focused on Vietnam, but also war movies are now becoming somewhat mythical, right? That One of the things about Apocalypse Now that is so interesting in terms of the scope of war movies is Apocalypse Now is concerned with accuracy in a way, but it's about emotional and psychological yeah. authenticity, not operational authenticity. Yeah. And Attenborough has always been interested in operational authenticity. Mm -hmm. So... He'd only directed two movies before this. One was Oh, What a Lovely War, which is an anti-war picture that starred John Lennon of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And the other was a biopic called Young Winston about the time that made Winston Churchill a man. Mm -hmm. But after that, you have Gandhi, right? So A Bridge Too Far is much more like The Bridge Over the River Kwai. It's a 1960s let's feel good about ourselves war movie. Yeah. But the problem, and I think it was uh, Vincent Canby at the New York Times who pointed this out, unlike A Longest Day, we don't win. And yeah. so you don't get that yeah. audience payoff at the end. Nobody goes away victorious. You know, that, that last scene in A Longest Day when, you know, thousands of guys are coming up off the beach and there's that stirring march. Mm -hmm. Here you have Boy Browning and Brian Urquhart Back in the rear, mm -hmm. Urquhart just wants to take a bath and Boy Browning is just sort of sitting behind his desk defeated. Yeah. So to capture that audience, especially, I mean, you think about 1977, Jimmy Carter, the age of malaise, inflation, mm. no, nobody wants to see this. Yeah, I think I hadn't thought about it in that in the context of its day, um, you know, how then has it become, or maybe, maybe I'm overstating the, the, the impact said, but how it seems like it's become in some ways a cultural touchstone since then, or at least it's a point of reference for the war and maybe just among people who are in the army. I don't know. I mean, do, do, is no. the country, are people still paying attention to this movie? They, it's on TV a lot. Okay. It's been on Amazon Prime. Yeah. It's been on a bunch of streaming services. I think one, because it was, for, in, in one sense, other than an episode of Band of Brothers, it's still the only comparatively recent cinematic treatment of the operation. Now, there was a movie before it about Market Garden called Theirs is the Glory. It's a 1946 movie that was actually oh, wow. made by the World War II British version of you. Mm -hmm. um, wow. It was a, a literal reenactment of Arnhem with the literal guys that were there. Um, so Johnny Frost, for example, the British first airborne commander in Arnhem, who's played by Anthony Hopkins, mm -hmm. plays himself in Theirs Was the Glory. Now, it's hard to watch for us today because it's overacted to our eyes in that way that movies were overacted in the middle of the 20th century, particularly British movies. Mm -hmm. um, but it was quite important in a sense, but it only focuses on the Red Devils in Arnhem. Mm -hmm. um, then we get the 506th and its little piece of the pie in Band of Brothers in an episode. But that's it. So if you are a person who's sort of interested in popular military history this movie is what you know visually of market garden mm -hmm. so i think on that note we can close our discussion on a bridge too far and then if we can just very briefly just shift to something else sure that um i think you're probably loaded for bear on is you think a lot and talk and write about this sort of thing, the impact of, of pop culture and movies on, on the way the country perceives its army. And, you know, the Vietnam War is maybe, you know, I, I came into the army based on the 1980s genre of the Vietnam War movies and, and the most 
well, the one I remember the most, I don't know if it's the most well-known, I don't even know if it did well at the box office, was was the Oliver Stone film Platoon. And then Huge hit. It was a huge hit, yeah. Okay. And and I know there was, a, after that, there was a full, you know, almost an industry of movies that portrayed Vietnam uh, as, you know, just, just kind of a chaotic experience with ineffective leadership, indisciplined soldiers who were put in a, in a war that they basically couldn't win. That was Things were very confusing. You know, there's all, in a lot of those movies, there's always a scene where um, a, an American soldier is trying to identify if this villager is Viet Cong or a villager or just a villager. Right. And there's some, that scene always ends horribly for the... For the villager. For the villager. <laughs> um, it, but, you know, I, I think I wonder about if how that has played into our and Oliver Stone was in the Vietnam War. Yes. He he was a he enlisted in the Vietnam War. Charlie Sheen is sort of his placeholder. Yeah, right, right. But he wasn't drafted. Right. But neither was Charlie Sheen. Right. There's that scene when they're when they're um on the S dash 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 detail, um, and they're telling their little stories mm-hmm. and the one African American GI asks how this kid got there and he goes, Yeah, I volunteered, volunteered infantry, volunteered That's combat right. in Vietnam. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So and anyway, I think maybe, maybe just in closing this out, you know, if we're, so we've gone from bridge too far to Vietnam. But how have that how have those movies really manifest or, or impacted the way the country thinks about the Vietnam War? I think you can't overestimate it in mm-hmm. a sense. Um, so you have in the arts generally the so-called Vietnam Renaissance, which starts about 76, 77. And it starts with Vietnam veterans writing short stories and poetry, and these are being published in small presses. And then you get some big award-winning books like uh, Going After Cacciato, yeah. Chicken Tim Hawk. Tim O'Brien. Um, and, and then you have Apocalypse Now, uh, Coming Home, uh, about a veteran. Prior to that, there'd been a, a, a fair few movies about Vietnam, but they were all in the drive-in grindhouse deranged Vietnam veteran genre, okay. like you know, Welcome Home Soldier Boys, mm-hmm. uh, where a bunch of SF veterans are, they're back together and they're driving cross country, but the man hassles them. So you get the pre-Sylvester Stallone Rambo shooting up the town scene, yeah. but in 1972. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but the the master narrative that Vietnam was a tactical failure, an operational failure, and a strategic failure because of craven leadership and generals and colonels who were ticket punching, that dominates, I think, the American sense of what that war was, in large part because of movies and in large part, too, because it comported sort of with the social discourse at the time. Um, And so... As odd as it seems, First Blood, the first of the Rambo franchise, is kind of a blow against that, right? Because whatever else happens, Rambo is sort of an ennobling character. And at the same time, then you begin to get the Vietnam veteran welcome home parades. They start in Chicago and and move Mm. around the country. Um, The Reagan administration, that era is very much about rehabilitating the image of the armed forces. Mm -hmm. So you get that slew of Golan Globus productions like, you know, the Delta Force and Raid on Entebbe. Um, So by the 90s, I think in a sense that has shifted. Mm -hmm. And you see that reflected in public opinion. It's still the case that of all the institutions of governance in the United States, um, the armed forces are the only ones that that have the confidence of the American people at levels, you know, 70, 80 and, and 90 percent. Mm-hmm. So there's a, a, a sort of a push backwards against that Vietnam centric sense of how the military, it hates its own soldiers, cannon fodder. It's a terrible place. So, you know, by the time you get into the contemporary era, you'll get something like we were soldiers once with mm-hmm. Mel Gibson, um, which is the anti anti Vietnam War movie. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I guess I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't thought of that. Um, b- because one thing that a lot of those movies show is there's a lot of dr- platoon. There's a lot of drug use. There's racism. 
it's not those are not people that you would want to represent the country for the most part. No. And I mean, there's a lot of evidence that certainly the army by 1970 and 1971 um, was breaking down in some oh, yeah. respects. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there were there were several well publicized race riots aboard aircraft carriers mm -hmm. uh, in Task Force 77. So those things were real. I, they perhaps get overemphasized in the public's mind because we see them in movies. And of course, we were talking about that earlier with A Bridge Too Far. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a sort of a project that I've been embarked on. What popular culture does is teaches Americans about American institutions. So what we know about the Founding Fathers, we see from, you know, 1776, the musical. And what we know about guerrilla warfare and the Revolutionary War, we know from Mel Gibson. And, and, and what we know about Vietnam, we know from Apocalypse Now and Go Tell the Spartans. And, and we were soldiers once. And that's, that's the great power of popular culture, I think, because you get the stereotypical platoon squad centric focus, like in Saving Private Ryan. There's always a character that you can identify with. There's a film sure. historian named Janine Basinger who wrote the, a groundbreaking book called The World War II Combat Film. Mm -hmm. And in it, she says, ever since World War II, um, that's why you have the so-called platoon movie. Because it's got enough character diversity, but it's a small enough collection of people that every film goer can find somebody to identify with. Mm, that's right. And so the yeah. more emotionally satisfying the movie, the more authentic, the more accurate. Um, you know, one of the things that everybody talked about with the with the Spielberg Hanks productions is their accuracy. Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers, The Pacific. Um it's what people think they know. And so that's what I've been doing a lot of research on and a lot of writing on is what popular culture does is teach people what the military is and what the military can do. Um, so if I go and, and, and I watch the, the Horse Soldiers movie, I believe, well, Donald Rumsfeld must have been right. We don't need field artillery. We don't need the Crusader program. We just need highly trained special operators with good old American ingenuity and we can defeat anybody. Mm -hmm. But I think that the, the risk there is as a commercial product, it's great, but as a social phenomenon, maybe not so great because then it sets us up for the kinds of disappointments that we had as a society after Vietnam and will almost certainly have now after Afghanistan. Let's um, close on this point and this final question is do you think we're going to see a genre of films about afghanistan or do you think people don't really care enough for that oh i expect that we will i mean we already have had some we've had some um, but but they haven't you haven't seen major blockbuster films that have been the number one two or three in the in the country about afghanistan or iraq no but if you think about vietnam so uh the last U.S. troops, at least main force troops, leave in 1973. Mm -hmm. You don't get blockbusters till Apocalypse Now in 1979, and that's okay. the weird vision of, of Francis Ford Coppola. Um, there's always a lag because society, in a sense, is processing the experience. Mm. Um, and then what Hollywood does is it renegotiates the experience for us going forward. If you if you look at production numbers, there's a drop off in war movies after World War II, and it's really not until Korea that you begin to get the kinds of war movies that we associate as the 1960s World War II war movie, um, because the war was too fresh; it was too clear in everyone's mind. Um, so you know you have the best years of our lives, directed by William Wyler in 1946, which is about the problems that veterans have readjusting to coming home. Mm -hmm. Extraordinarily powerful movie. Should be showed in every out-processing demobilization station in the army all the time. And then there's a kind of a lull and there's onesies and twosies, but they're just filler. And then you begin to get those big productions that lead up ultimately to the longest day and then a bridge too far. So there will be 
small stuff. The other thing, of course, is we've had some really powerful documentary work on Afghanistan. Um, That's right. Restrepo, for example. Yeah. And so we also have cell phones with cameras. Mm -hmm. So visually, Afghanistan, in a sense, is much closer to us mm -hmm. than Vietnam would have been. Um, so there'll be some time. The other problem, of course, is you're not going to see the a bridge too far of Afghanistan because after Operation Anaconda, we really don't have any large scale engagements that would look any different from the horse soldiers movie. It's, you know, Taliban and foreign fighters wearing Afghan gear and American dudes wearing American dude gear that looks like American dude gear. Yeah. There have been some Danish films that are kind of interesting. There's a Danish movie about a squad of Danish special operators. Um who called in fires because they were surrounded, but the dude broke the, the rules of engagement for the Danish forces in terms of calling in the fires. He did not have literal eyes on the target. He was sort of guesstimating, and the ROE that the Danes were operating under at the time, that was against the rules. So it's a courtroom drama, largely, oh, about wow. how the Danish government decided whether or not they were going to hold him out as an example of how Denmark stood for the law of war. Mm. Um, there are some British films. There's a very interesting New Zealand documentary about New Zealand troops um, on foot patrol in Afghanistan. So there'll be a lot of that before we get any more cinematic treatments. Mm. Well, Russell, I want to thank you. This was really a fascinating journey, not only into A Bridge Too Far, but I think, you know, the role of, of movies, the role of American film in our understanding of, of our military and our wars. So, well, thank you for having me. It's been a real treat for me. Great. Well, hopefully we'll have you back on. You have a lot to say. so I do. <laughs> and, and, and I work a mile and a half away, so That's right. it's not too hard to get me. That's right. Thanks so much, sir. Thank you. Take care. Appreciate yeah. it. Okay. That was my discussion with Russell Burgos. A lot there. A lot to think about. Like I said on there, I came into the Army after watching all these Vietnam War films, you know, and then reading about Vietnam and wanting to understand more about it. And I think there's, I think that's the same story for a lot of American soldiers. You know, it's important. It's important we understand these films, the veracity thereof, the accuracy thereof. And we understand the role that they play on the way the country thinks about the military and the way the country thinks about war. So he was the perfect guest for that. I hope we have him back. I hope we have you back. I hope you continue to listen to the show. Please subscribe to the 18th Airborne Corps podcast. Please leave a five-star rating and a review. That helps others find the show. Thank you so much. Please continue to listen. Listen.